so welcome to another episode of Inside the Black Box. Uh, the black box that we're going to open up today is the classic Nintendo NES controller from the American release of the machine. Um, this is something that people have probably used a lot and um, not thought about how it works internally. And actually there is some really nice engineering here. Um, if you recall back from the previous episode where we took apart the 2600 joystick, uh, that favored a kind of simplicity model. There were just five switches connected to five uh, six pins on the plug and that's it. And Nintendo took a very different road engineering this device uh, because the economics of electronics uh, had changed a lot by the time Nintendo was building this compared to when Atari was building uh, their stick. So uh, let's open this thing up and see what it looks like. Um, the first thing to notice is that it has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, switches, right? So you've got your up, down, left, right, A, B, select and start. So in theory, uh, Rembai said last time that whenever you've got any electrical device, you need to have as many cables as there are switches plus an additional one for ground, right? So in theory, you could wire this thing up using the same plug that Atari used because that's got nine pins, right? So you could have one pin for up, one for down, one for left, one for right, select start A and B and then ground. And you could totally do that uh, inside one of these uh, DB9 plugs like uh, the Atari used. But if you look carefully, at the plug that comes with the, one of the things I really like about this controller is the ridiculously long cable. They really understood uh, the couch nature of gaming uh, by that stage. Uh, but if you look at the uh, plug from the NES, you'll notice that it actually only has five pins here, right? Uh, well, it's actually got more than five, but only five are connected. So we've got one, two, three, four above and three below, which is seven. So how do you get eight buttons connected through seven cables? Right? All right, there's a bit of magic going on. Let's have a look to see how that works. So uh, one of the things that's interesting about this device as well is that it's completely not ergonomic, right? It's very square sides. It was designed very much to match the look of the machine. And part of that is um, the kind of ergonomics wave in design hadn't really hit by the early 80s when this machine was invented. So uh, people didn't really think about that. If you look at a lot of controllers from the day, like the Mega Drive, uh, sorry, not the Mega Drive, the uh, Master System, uh, also was not very uh, kind of comfortable to use, etc. If you compare that to today's controllers, even going back to like, uh, you know, the original Xbox or PlayStation. Um, in fact, PlayStation is a great example of a controller that hit kind of after the ergonomics wave because it's very nicely contoured to the human hand. You can play it for a long time without getting any cramps. I'm sure people playing Contra on this have got, you know, missing fingers and things. So uh, anyway, flip this thing around in the back. You've got your beautiful little Nintendo logo there and just six regular screws. Um, this is the phase when Nintendo was still using regular screws and not their kind of, you know, uh, proprietary security screws, which I don't know how much security there is on that because it takes you about three units on eBay to find a screwdriver that you can use to, to crack open like a 3DS or something. But anyway, uh, so let's crack this open very carefully. Uh, I don't want to hurt this because this is a real NES controller. So I don't want anybody to say that I'm abusing the elderly, so I want to be super careful with this one. All right, there we go. Oh, look how different that is than a 2600. The first thing that we see is there is a microchip in here, right? Um, the reason we see a microchip here is by the time that Nintendo had uh, designed this device, which would have been the kind of early 80s, 81, 82, the price of silicon manufacture had dropped to a point where it was actually very much affordable to on something as kind of cheap and throwaway as a controller to add a piece of silicon like this, right? Uh, and in fact, the reason that they decided to go with one, two, three, four, five, six cables uh, and a piece of silicon instead of nine cables is by the time this was designed, it was cheaper to include a microchip and fewer cables than to add the cables, right? When Atari was doing their stick, Cables were cheaper than microchips, so they decided to go down the cables route. Uh, these guys decided to go down the microchip route because they saved some money. So that's kind of interesting. Um, this particular chip, uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. I'm going to try and hold up so that you can see the serial number. So there's a bit of text. Uh, there it is. Uh, on the chip itself, and it says it's a HD 401, 4021. Uh, that's important. That identifies the kind of chip it is and what it does. So let's uh, pop open this and see what's on the other side. Oh, the other thing that's very nice about this is um, you can actually see uh, here where the cables are written on the board uh, what color connects to what, right? So the people who are assembling this in the factory, this is in the time before assembly being done completely by robots. 
uh, there would have been somebody sitting on the production line, uh, typically a woman would have been working on an electronics production line in those days, uh, to make it simple for that person to not make a mistake, they would have written the color of the cable uh, so that when you solder things in, um, everything is correct. And it also, of course, makes it easier when you're doing your quality check later, right? Because uh, whoever's eyeballing this can just see, oh yeah, yellow matches yellow, brown, etc., and then nice and easy. So that's already a nice piece of engineering right there. Uh, it's the device is designed to be foolproof to build and simple to test, right? That's super important. All right, so let's unthread this here. And now, is there a cable or is it just, oh, it's just kind of held in by force. Oh, there we go. All right, there we go. So there it is. Um, it's a very 80s looking PC board. And one of the reasons you can tell it's 80s is these traces are kind of round. Uh, you see they're curvy. Uh, these days, all the routing, the uh, PC design is done by computer. And the computers route everything to kind of 45 degree line. So they look very kind of robotic. Uh, it always looks like somebody kind of drew these by hand, I mean, which they didn't. But, uh, so here's the D-pad. And here we see, I, I mentioned this in the previous episode, uh, this is the beginning of this kind of capacitive rubber technology, which is just everywhere now, right? The remote control for your TV has it, the garage door opener for your car has it. Uh, and the way it works is you've got, um, on the PC board, you've got these two points here, which are a switch, essentially, right? So to close the switch, what you need to do is close that gap between them. So the white part here is just regular rubber, but the middle part, which is dark, is also a rubber-like substance, but it's capacitive. So it actually conducts electricity. So when this is here, it's flexible enough that I can push it and it kind of pops back by its own. And by doing that, I'm closing the switch. Very, very cheap to manufacture. Um, really, really bad for recycling, incidentally. Um, but of course, you know, in the 80s, nobody cared about recycling. Um, so that's how that works. So we've got what looks like something much more complicated uh, than the Atari controller. And the magic of this really is in this 4021 chip, right? And so what you'll notice is these are the 16 legs of the chip. Um, so if, if we were to follow these, you know, if you uh, go and look up a circuit diagram of this online, you'll see that we have every one of these switches has one leg going back to a pin. And then the magic of converting that into just the six cables that go back to the NES is done by the 4021 device. So let's go to the whiteboard and uh, look at how the 4021 works. Okay, so this is the CD4021B 4020, uh, chip that's inside the NES controller. Uh, it has 16 legs like we talked about. There's eight on this side, eight on the other side. And here I've written in green uh, the buttons to which they are connected on the controller, right? Up, down, left, right, A, B, select and start. And then in red, we've got uh, the actual uh, connections that go back to the NES, right? So the five pins that we saw uh, on the plug. So you've got plus five, which is, of course, you need some electricity to drive this chip. You don't get anything for free. Uh, you've got ground. You always have ground on any electrical device, right? That's where the current ends up once you're done with it. And then the three magical ones, data, clock, and latch. So what happens uh, when the NES wants to uh, sample the controller to see what the player is doing, what the NES will do is it will send a signal through this latch pin to the device. And at that moment, what happens is the 4021 will take a snapshot of what's happening on these green pins and it'll kind of save it internally, right? So it'll uh, say uh, in a very small amount of time, just a you know, fraction of a millisecond, it'll say, okay, is up, down, up, push, down, push, left, push, etc. And then it kind of saves it internally. And then it kind of sits there waiting, right? Then the next thing the NES will do is it will start sending signals along this clock line. So it'll send the first signal on clock and the 4021 will return the state of this. So it'll tell you if up is pushed or not. So you'll get a one if it's pushed and a zero if it's not, right? So you'll clock, then you'll return either zero or one and that will flow out through data, right? So it's gonna push clock signals in and it gets data out. And because we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these, you need to send eight clock signals to get the complete state of what the controller is doing, right? So for example, let's say you were pushing up and A at the time uh, that we hit the, the latch pin. What will happen then is your clock, you'll get a one, next clock zero, next clock zero, next clock zero, next clock one, zero, zero, zero. And then at that point, the Nintendo will let go of the latch so it'll stop sending a signal on this pin 
and then it knows. Okay, so for this frame of the game, the player was pressing uh, up and A, right? Um, so the interesting thing about the 4021 is you'll notice some of these pins are put X through because they aren't actually used in the way the NES uses them, but the uh, Super NES, uh, which actually supported uh, as many as 16 buttons on its controller because it had uh, the same buttons, of course, as the uh, NES did, but it also added uh, four additional ones, right? It had X, Y as well, and it also had the shoulder button, so it added four additional ones. How did they do that? Because there aren't enough pins on here. It only supports eight buttons. Well, the 4021 has a special mode where you can connect 4021s to each other in a configuration called the daisy chain. So one of these pins here allows the data from another one of these to flow through. So I can clock this one and once I've gotten all eight, when I do the ninth clock, it'll start fetching from the next device that's connected in the chain. And what's interesting is you can actually take a Super Nintendo controller, switch out the plug so that it's got an NES controller, plug it into an NES and use it just fine. Because the NES is just going to clock your controller eight times because it only knows about eight buttons, right? So it's going to clock it eight times and it'll get back the first eight things which are pushed uh, on the Super NES controller. Uh, and that actually works just fine. It's a very simple project. If you ever want to play uh, NES games with your Super NES controller, you can just build a very simple adapter uh, that basically just changes the shape of the plug, right? So that the SNES plug can go to the NES plug. Okay, so that is then how the kind of magical goo inside this 4021 operates. Uh, so essentially what you're doing is the Nintendo says, I want to grab a snapshot, it latches, reads the set of all the buttons, then with eight clock pulses, sucks them into itself through the data pin, uh, does whatever it needs to do, and then you flip the next frame of Mario and away you go, right? Uh, and so this is really the first of the second generation of video game controllers that use some kind of, instead of using a direct connection like the uh, Atari 2600 used, use some kind of encoding, right? And this kind of tradition continues. Uh, modern USB joysticks use a similar kind of idea, right? The buttons are connected to a USB uh, controller and the controller does something similar. It converts the simultaneous pushes into a kind of serial stream of data that goes back to your controller. Um, so what's interesting about this though is that when um, there is an organization called JAMA, which stands for the Japanese Amusement Machine Manufacturers Association, uh, and JAMA essentially set a standard for what uh, arcade controls, uh, arcade monitors and so on should look like uh, from a technical point of view, right? So it's an engineering standards body. Uh, and so they actually opted to do controllers not using a controller in this way, but using the direct connection method that the Atari uses. So if you crack open a Street Fighter II machine, for example, uh, you will find that there is one cable per uh, switch in your joystick and in your buttons and the reason JAMA decided to do that was if you think about it um, there is going to be a delay between you pushing a button and the signal going back to the Nintendo here right because when you push the button you have to wait for the machine to latch the controller eight pulses to get your data back and then let go of the latch before you can take results right and of course that happens ridiculously fast right the Nintendo wasn't a very fast machine but compared to you know, the speed at which your brain is operating to perceive what's going on, it's almost indistinguishable. Uh, you know, it might be a fraction of a millisecond. Um, but the JAMA um, body, uh, because they were worried about things like you know, super competitive uh, Street Fighter gameplay, they were already doing professional uh, tournaments and so on, they wanted essentially a zero delay mechanism and so they chose uh, the direct connection. So that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, when, when you start to think about delaying controllers, you know, adding a controller is really bad. And then the worst thing is adding wireless because you have a controller on this side which converts this data to some kind of, you know, wireless magical goo on the ether. And then it kind of goes across and then the receiver has to kind of do the reverse process. Uh, and so, you know, the reason we can do that on a machine like the Xbox or the PlayStation is because they are so ridiculously powerful and fast that all that stuff happens without any chance that your, your brain is not going to be able to react to the amount of delay it imposes. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that look at how uh, Nintendo put together their uh, device. Much more complex in terms of design, but economically it made a lot of sense because they were able to uh, save money from the fact that silicon costs less than copper, essentially. Um, and that is really the beginnings of the new generation of controllers. So uh, thanks for watching. Uh, take care. I'll see you soon.